Everyone may know from the schedule we looked at that the theme for this upcoming uh, fall term will be engineering and medicine. And so we've designed, we've designed this last year where we had a whole theme of speakers in the energy area for the fall term and with a kickoff symposium. This year we're doing the same thing, focusing on engineering and medicine. And so we'll have an all day symposium on uh, coinciding with uh, homecoming weekend on Friday, October 17th. But so all the speakers you'll see throughout this term will be in the theme of engineering and medicine. And, and so uh, this is really kind of just a recognition of the fact that actually Thayer has had a long and rich history in engineering and medicine. Many faculty, many grants, and many students have focused in this area for, for decades. And so it's a recognition of that fact. And, uh, you know, when you think about engineering and medicine, Sometimes I, I, I see the enormous number of pitfalls that, that are there, the difficulty in communicating with uh, physicians, difficulty in, between, in setting up formal collaborations. And sometimes I'm amazed, actually, that we actually get anything done because it takes so many meetings, it takes so much work, it takes so much travel between hospital and engineering school. Um, and that's why I think it's... A, so appropriate to have our speaker today, Alex Hartop, who is really one of the people who has been sort of the backbone and one of the driving force of engineering medicine at Thayer and at Dartmouth. So Alex uh, got his bachelor's in of science and electrical engineering with high honors from Northeastern University. He then came up here to Dartmouth to the Upper Valley, did his master's and PhD at the, here at the Thayer School in 1998, finishing his PhD in 1991. He then went out, did some consulting work in his own company, uh, did a number of things for several years, and in 1996 was attracted back to Thayer as an assistant professor. And just this past June in 2008, has finally achieved the rank of full professor in the professorial ranks. That's it. That's as high as you go. So, so it's uh, quite an achievement. He has uh, several patents behind him, several grants related to operating microscopes, <coughs> electrical impedance, prostate cancer screening, breast cancer imaging. Uh, he has there, he's taught statistics, electrical network theory, instrumentation, and has a course planned for digital image processing. He's, he's published over 170 papers and abstracts. And this past summer, he ran an international conference on electrical impedance tomography, which took uh, sessions right here in this room. So we're very happy to have him as our top speaker. And uh, please welcome Alex Archie. Can everyone hear me? Okay, well, these introductions do sound to me a lot better than what is warranted, in, <laughs> in my opinion. So I will try to live up to this. Uh, very nice introduction. Um, my talk will be uh, about um, a number of projects that I've been involved in at Thayer School over quite a number of years, starting from when I was a graduate student here myself and continuing on to almost uh, today. Um, the, um, the main thrust behind this talk is to emphasize uh, biomedical engineering at Thayer and also to uh, demonstrate the kind of collaboration that are possible between Dar uh, Thayer School of Engineering, Dartmouth Medical School and also the folks at uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, which I think puts uh, Thayer School in a unique position to conduct research in biomedical engineering. Um, I'm not sure what you guys think. Um, I wanted to uh, talk about uh, broadly two kinds of topics. One will have to do with image-guided surgery, which uh, pertains largely to neurosurgery uh, uh, as far as the projects that we're doing at Dartmouth is concerned, and also electrical impedance imaging, which I've been involved in for uh, some years now since uh, 1996 when Keith Paulson invited me to come work on his project, which uh, uh, caused me to come back to Dartmouth, essentially. Um, to start with, I would like to talk about uh, Stereotaxi, which was the, uh, the um, 
uh, idea behind what we uh, would later call frameless stereo taxi uh, and which now we call image guided uh, neurosurgery. Uh, stereo taxi is a fairly simple concept. You fix a rigid frame of reference onto a patient's head. Now it may be simple, it's not necessarily painless. And by uh, having some uh, uh, preoperative x-rays from a couple of uh, angles, you can do a treatment plan to uh, reach some deep-seated deep sites that are of interest, either because you want to remove it uh, through cautery or some other means, or you want to take a sample of it to find out what is wrong, or perform a small lesion to cure, to cure tremors or any number of conditions. Uh, this uh, was invented somewhere, well, developed, I shouldn't say invented, uh, somewhere around 1908 and has been used uh, for quite some time. Uh, the only thing about that is that it does not really allow you to remove large tumors. Uh, another thing to, uh, to say is that its uh, 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 use continued into the times of uh, CTs which uh, uh, appeared somewhere in the late 60s and also the MRIs somewhere in the early 70s. And the reason for that is that you could take a CT of a patient with the frame and have the treatment planning done much more easily. Now, starting with this concept of reaching a target in the brain and the uh, uh, previous method that involved the frame which when you go in the operating room is really a uh, hindrance to the surgeon if one were to, uh, to try to operate. If you, all you want to do is insert a probe, that's fine, but if you want to do surgery, it gets in the way. So, a uh, couple of folks here at Dartmouth uh, uh, thought that if one could devise a system for tracking 3D in 3D, uh, the patient as well as the tools that you use on the patient, uh, co-register that with pre-op data that would be the CT or the MR at that time, and do away entirely with the stereotaxic frame and have the computers keep track of where things are instead of a rigid frame, that would be a, a great improvement over way, the way the things are done. And so, uh, John Strobain, who was my uh, thesis advisor, and Dave Roberts, uh, who's uh, still a neurosurgeon here at DHMC, I don't see him here, <laughs> uh, started a project somewhere in the early 80s to try and implement that. And uh, what they uh, did is uh, they found that there are, uh, there were then um, available uh, spark gap. 3D trackers, and what they consisted of is a fairly simple concept. Um, I don't have a pointer here. Did anyone? Oh, I might have one in my bag. Uh, I think so. That should work. Yeah, okay. This guy here is a spark gap. It's about the size of my little finger. I mean, it's next to a quarter here. On the end there, it's nothing uh, very uh, complicated. Two pieces of metal, you uh, send a high voltage and it just goes and makes a spark. The spark is a noise. It's broadband uh, pulse. This picture here, although it's not very uh, clear, is a, a rigid frame that we used to mount on the ceiling of the operating room in the hospital on Maynard Street there and it had three microphones, okay? And with those three microphones we could do a time of flight uh, distance calculation on the spark gap and then solve for the 3D location of that spot. So that was our uh, uh, first 3D tracker. So with that uh, basic uh, tool uh, available, they constructed a uh, triangular uh, device here with, uh, which held three spark gaps, one here, one here, one here. And imagine this being attached to the operating microscope, which is a device that uh, is um, uh, designed on a robotic arm that locks into place and, and comes loose and is balanced just so, th so that it won't uh, just drop down when you unlock the brake. So uh, this is uh, a fairly uh, sophisticated piece of mechanical apparatus on which you have the microscope and then we have on that also our uh, 3D tracker. 